Okay, well, welcome um, everyone to this L2 um, thread. Um, if you don't know me, my name is um, Carol Jordan, um, and I'm the kind of the global uh, community coaching lead for Learning2. So I work with John uh, Micton um, in Europe and then Jordan Benedict in, um, in Asia, and we kind of um, coach and coordinate the, the Learning2 um, presenters. Uh, many, if you've been to other L2 threads that we've had through Zoom, you will have um, met some of those um, presenters. Uh, very uh, delighted actually today to be um, the host for Monica, who is going to um, talk to us about being a um, learning um, support um, teacher and, and what that's like. Um, in, a, in a virtual world. But I think before we just get um, started, maybe if you could just quickly introduce yourself, um, say where you're from and, and what you teach. So, um, Annalie, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, my name is Annalie Kress. I work with Stephen and Marianne at the American School of Milan, and I am the tech coordinator uh, for K through eight. Great. Erin? Yeah, I'm Erin Foley. I am a science teacher and MYP coordinator at Bavarian International School in Munich. Marianne? Hi, my name is Marianne DeRose and I'm the learning support specialist at uh, American School of Milan for kindergarten through second grade. Clement? Hi, I'm Clement. I'm from Zurich International School. I'm a STEM coordinator there and uh, work with Anka. Clint. Hey everybody, my name is Clint Carlson. I'm the Director of Education Technology at the Istanbul International Community School in Istanbul, Turkey. Mm -hmm. Anka. Unmute. Um, I'm at Zurich International with Clement, and I'm the ed tech coach slash learning tech, uh, ed tech coordinator slash learning tech coach. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Steve. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Viss. I'm the elementary school principal at the uh, International School of Latvia. Hi, Clint. Okay. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hi, Nee. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Heini Chen. I'm the Chinese teacher at the International School of Zurgen Luzern and also at the Lemania School in Arterdorf in Switzerland. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to be your um, host today and we're going to start. Monica is going to um, just talk to you a little bit about set the scene, um, talk about her own context that she is in her school. Um, and Monica had initially was going to um, give a teacher um, workshop at the Bavarian um, International School Conference. Is that correct, Monica? Um, and the conference was was cancelled and Monica said, yeah, I still want to want to do it. Um, but a lot has happened since then. So what she's going to do, is she's going to kind of set the scene for you. She had originally um, uh, had a, a range of um, digital tools that she uses with her learning support students um, prior to school closure, prior to COVID. She's going to be talking a little bit about those um, resources and how she used them then. And then she's going to talk to us about how she has trans, um, transferred those into a, a kind of an online setting, um, how she's using them now, what she's added um, into her portfolio of digital tools. Um, that she uses to help support the, um, the learning support um, students that are in her caseload. So I'll pass it over to you, Monica. Thank you. Uh, so this year at ISL, I am teaching grade five learning support and uh, there's 100 students in grade five and my caseload doubled from last year. So I have 30 diagnosed uh, learning support students, mainly dyslexia, some ADHD, not any super high needs, but students that still needed some type of intervention. And I was thinking, how am I going to support all of these students uh, in the limited time that I do get to work with them? Because we uh, run more of a push-in model and I only see a very small number of students uh, uh, that are pulled out against German and all the rest of my time is in the class with them. 
Um, I do have a slot in the mornings where students can arrive anywhere between 8.30 and 8.50. And so I set that up as a time that I could do more interventions with students. Um, but there would be, you know, 10 to 15 of them, you know, coming through my classroom. And I wasn't sure who would come when. So I kind of looked to digital tools to see how I could further impact my time with them. Um, and also I was looking for different tools I could integrate to build their independence because I work with students who are heading off fast and furiously to middle school. And I think for every learning support students, independence, uh, that feeling that they can participate with their peers to the best of their ability is crucial. So I was also looking for any tools I could integrate that would provide that independence for them and support their learning in a really um, kind of transparent sort of way that didn't make them feel like they stood out. So some of the things that I came across that have worked really well this year, um, the first are some Chrome extensions. Um, I use Just Read, um, and, and any, I'm happy to show them later or talk more about them later, but Just Read is a Chrome extension that wipes away all the advertisements um, from any, any website that a student might go on to when they're doing research. So then they can then, that works great for ADHD kids um, who can get distracted very easily. Um, I will share resources at the end. I have it on, I have a document I'll put in there. Um, and then we also use Read Aloud uh, quite extensively. So they can then take any, anything online, uh, highlight it and have that read to them. And we also use that uh, in, the Google, in our Google Docs. So they have to use that as part of their editing process to have their piece of writing read back to them. Uh, of course, uh, I know Chrome also has a read write extension, but that's a fee based one. So I was also, I had a really small budget. So everything I found I could use without paying a subscription fee. And those three tools, uh, voice to text, just read and read aloud have been um, indispensable at the moment now because I can refer them back to it. All I had to do was make a quick time screen recording video reminding them how to install them at home and how, to how we use them at school. And they've been continually using them at home. So I feel like that was quite um, seamless for them to go from school to home and maintain their independence. Um, another thing I used this year was Flipgrid prior to COVID. I was using it as a running reading record. So I could scan a very small piece of text. I usually use the week junior because I think it's important to give students authentic texts um, and also not attempting to level them all the time because that's not what they're always going to get as they move to middle school. So just re uh, the week junior is a News magazine written for children, I use it in a lot of different ways, but this is really great because they have really small little piece of text that maybe has five sentences. I can uh, take a photo of it, add it to Flipgrid. The student records themselves reading that piece of text. And then in school, I would um, conference with them right after they finished reading. So we could also record the conference in the response bit. And then we could kind of see the things they still needed to work on, be that decoding or comprehension. So thankfully, I've been able to keep up with that during this whole time. So I'm still getting weekly uh, samples of hearing students read using Flipgrid, which is invaluable for me as a learning support teacher just to see um, any gaps I still need to fill. The uh, other thing that I used was Book Creator. I used it though going through um, the, uh, the web platform. So they don't go in on iPads and they don't go in through the app, they go in online. And that way they're working in my library so I can see everything. And the reason uh, I chose to use Book Creators, one, I wasn't allowed to use Seesaw <laughs> because it's only up to grade three in our school next year. That's changing. Um, the thing that was so versatile about Book Creator is that I could leave uh, verbal instructions for my severely dyslexic students. They could record their voices back to me. Uh, they could highlight things in the book. So I used it in multiple ways. I had them reflect on their thinking if they did a math problem and they explained how they got their answer. Um, I used it to work on um, spelling. So if there was like a specific sound blend they were working on, I can create a page and, and put it in multiple books and uh, they can then record their voice reading words. I can hear any errors they're making. Um, and usually I used it uh, following an, 
a lesson I had done with them on a specific sound. And this was kind of a follow up to reinforce what we had talked about. And I can also hear them reading different things. So I, you know, sometimes it's really helpful with learning sports students to have that um, record. I've unfortunately had to let Book Creator go during the whole COVID-19 because I didn't want to burden them with having to go into too many different platforms when some of them are just struggling to even keep up with all their work. So that's something that I've had to um, abandon. Um, and the last one I used a lot at school, but I don't use so much anymore is Prismo Go, which is a free app you can use on any iPad and you take a photo of a piece of text and it turns it uh, into audio. And the paid version also translates but I only use the um, audio version. You can slow down the pace of the speaker. Um, and so that's been invaluable for kids being able to take a photo of any piece of text a teacher might give them in a class. So those are the kind of things that I've been using um, this year to really impact my students' learning. I feel like I spoke maybe too quickly, but... Mm -hmm. Um, Monica, I heard you talk about um, how you use, you use Book Creator and now that you're in school closer, uh, uh, the school is closed, you're not using it anymore. I'm just wondering about how you're prioritizing because we know that when you're working online, you can't do everything that you, that you yeah. used to do. So, so how are you prioritizing? How have you decided what is the most critical supports that you need to provide your learners that you must find a way to be able to deliver online? And what are those things that you're kind of having to kind of let go of at the moment? Okay, um, so as, the way it's working at our school is as it's grade five team, we have five classes. So we create a Moscow document each week um, that's sent out to all the students from their homeroom teacher, but it looks the same for all the students. And in it, we're having you know a, a must do math, reading unit, some things from specialists, and then a should do and a could do. And we have all the links to any, anything a student would need is in that Moscow document. So they just click on a link, it takes you to a slideshow. Uh, video from Miss Lynch, it's in the Moscow and we have the tips at the bottom. So I had to kind of let go of some interventions that I was working on to then shift my focus to supporting students finishing things in that must do column because I know it's going to take them longer. Um, so I've been then having drop-in sessions with students and helping them, let's say, plan their writing or we'll do a little mini editing uh, session or a focus on something that had to do with what's in that must-do column. Um, also, we had the three weeks before the break and now we have, um, we're just back our first week. So I don't know if I'll be able to shift back to some of the interventions I was doing before to hit some of the other targets my students had. But at the moment, I just feel like it's more important to support them um, completing the work that's been set for them and giving them strategies to do that. So I'm always trying to think about a strategy. So I make a lot of videos, I give them time to look at it, see if they can try that. And then we have a drop-in session a day or two later to see if we can work on it that way. That's what we're doing, but, I, but I, I'm, I'm trying to be flexible and respond to student needs and also anticipate, anticipate what they might need. So um, if we're doing anything on the Moscow that I think they would need an extra step to break it down, I preemptively do that and they kind of get sent, maybe they would have two columns to help them organize their working or their writing or something like that, depending on the specific student. Great, thank you. I'm just wondering about, you know, um, um, the rest of you, what, what tools and strategies have you found have been working with your learning support? Um, students, what are you finding you're really leveraging at this time and, and is working really, really well? Um, I'm not going to speak as a teacher, but I'll speak as a parent of someone who's in learning support. And typically in a, he's in high school in grade 10, and typically everything to keep himself organized, he uses digital tools. And we've kind of flipped that at home. So he has all the digital tools there, but because I'm the one having to provide that support and I don't have um, purview into all the work that he has. Like I can't, well, technically I can because I work for tech, I could get into his account. But um, I basically have him create a, a document each week with each of his eight subjects. And he has to physically create the document, put it on his door and um, basically timeline when he's gonna complete what. So I found that's been very useful as a parent walking in, I can quickly see and then I don't tell him what to do, but I ask him, I'm like, okay, so what do you have 
um, do like tomorrow that you have to work on today and he can you know easily refer to it and things like that so I think it's helped him it's a discussion artifact for us to make him also rem remember um, remind himself in a way of what he has to be on top of. Inka, you're making me think of like the video I made uh, Tuesday was about, I think a lot of my students had been making nine o'clock math, 10 o'clock, I don't know, writing. And I, I walked them through, actually, no. Nine o'clock is math slide seven. <laughs> Answer the question, take a photo, upload it to my drive. So I've had to even do it like another step of it. And then I'm having them use a timer uh, you're, I only want them sitting for half an hour. Um, I talked about also um, where you're doing your work because I can just see in my house, my son, who's also a learning sports student, takes his computer and sits on his bed. And, and you know, that's sending his brain a message. It's like relaxing time. So we kind of were talking to kids about um, where you're working and how you're working and that you should, you know, timer and then move. So that's been helpful this week. We'll see how long it lasts. Yeah, like the first week I kind of demonstrated how to do it, like you said, how detailed <laughs> yeah. the note has to be. To, <laughs> and then um, after that, I just kind of checked to make sure he's doing it. But you're right, after about week three, laziness sets in, you know, just write it quickly. And so you just, um, as a parent, just being back on him and just saying, okay, it's not helping you. So, you know, yeah. let's go. Yeah. Yeah. As some students I'm checking in with in the morning or they're emailing me their uh, plan for the day. Yeah, at our, yeah. At our school, um, learning support is we have scheduled synchronous time. So we're at the high school. We have scheduled synchronous time, right. half an hour for each class, five classes a day. And in that schedule for kids who not all learning support kids, but let's say the ones that are actually assigned an actual class of learning support, they continue right. to meet. Yeah, we're, I'm, so I'm meeting with my, uh, my students that I would see uh, four times a week. I have classes with them and we're working on specific things and then the others I'm trying to do drop-in sessions with targeted focus. Well, we're calling them drop-in, but they're kind of mandatory. <laughs> um, yeah, most of them are coming. So you're having specific um, times with your learning support um, students mm -hmm. to, yeah. to work on teaching, reading and writing and other kinds of um, supports that they, that they need? Yes. Okay. Okay. What are some other folks doing? I can only speak, I'm um, very close with our other learning support teacher who um, teaches three through five, whereas Marion is for our younger elementary. Um, but I have to say having those scheduled times with um, the students when all the other students are sort of left in, during the asynchronous times to have lessons with, you know, a video and written directions and they're meant to complete it by four o'clock. Um, our other learning support teacher and Marianne have scheduled times with those students so they can one-on-one -on -one carry them through those asynchronous times. Um, so they're not sort of left to their own devices to figure it out and post it. And sometimes you know, they're, they're helping them with the academics. Sometimes they're helping them with the tech. Sometimes they're helping them make the schedule. You know, it's not just with the academics that, that they're struggling with sometimes. It's the no. whole package. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. um, having that set up where they're having constant one-on-one -on -one time with our learning support teachers has made the biggest difference. What we've also tried to do is any, like if we get one or two questions or one or two things that seem like the kids aren't getting as soon as that happens um my team is kind of we're talking about it and i will make like a quick video about oh if you're working on the math problem remember to do this and i'm reminding them to use your multiplication square get out your grid paper let's draw the rectangle and then that can be shared with them and parents and then they will they can watch it multiple times if they need to so that's been helpful too because um, we're not having them have a task due at the end of the day they have to have a, something done by wednesday and something done by friday like they have more time so um, that, that we found really helpful too, is just a, a short video that we can share whenever we need to. Okay. Yeah. So Annalie, in your school, are they, are those kind of walkthroughs and supports, are they done on Zoom? How are they, how, how are they done? They're kind of a face-to-face? -face? Yeah. And Marianne can speak to it too. Um, but it's mostly through Zoom. So they have yeah. scheduled we, meetings one-on-one -on -one or in small groups on Zoom. Okay. Marianne? As learning support, I see the kids five days a week. You know, some of like the, the general ed populations, they do like 
uh, two sessions in math, two sessions in reading, and then they kind of go off and do their own things. But for our, our learning needs kids, they need that routine, exact same time, 40 minutes every day. So they get about two and a half to three hours of synchronous instruction. And we find that to be the most effective way. The other thing that's really important for uh, my first and second graders is the engagement piece. You know, attention drives learning. Like they're not going to go off and do what you want them to do unless they are super engaged. So our library, our librarian, we have an amazing librarian, but um, she's subscribed to like Pebble Go, which is like this great app with like a variety of topics that the kids can just look at and choose like, you know, they want to learn about Michael Jordan or Lionel Messi and then they can go and read. It's a fantastic app. Um, and we're also like changing Epic up our books is a little bit. Sorry. Epic Books is great too. We've been using Epic Books a lot. Really good one too. Yeah. So um, I don't know if we were allowed to share that ASM website, um, Stephen, but she is like, there's a lot for the kids to choose from. And I use that as a learning support. And I, I, kind of, I actually teach, you know, I have first and second graders, so I talk to their parents and like, like go on this, check this out. And then they, they get used to like one or two apps that they love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That uh, library website is public. So you can post it in the chat if you want. Is, so, everyone, is everyone here elementary? No, no we've, got a, we've got a mix. Yeah. Because uh -huh. oh, I just wanted to, okay, because I'll just, uh, I mean, one thing, again, um, I don't know if this is just, of course, you know, you, you people thought of this, but um, testing in a time situation with, um, so like my son just like the other day had a math test that he just like, broken down do you know what i mean that idea of i'm, I'm thinking that a, a kid can look at the test on the screen do the work on paper throw in a graph here and you got to kind of try to look at the graph and what it says um that that idea of assessment i think needs to really um pull away from stress testing you know mm. That, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to get away from that as much as we can. We're kind of, we're in the process right now of sort of rethinking assessment and what it could look like. Yeah. Um, we're, for the most part, we probably have enough data in most of our subjects that we could write our end of year reports now if we, if we had to. Um, and the IB gave us some flexibility. They said you don't have to assess all four criteria twice this year. If it, if it doesn't work, you know, you can use whatever data you have to inform your achievement levels. So we're, we might take as much advantage of that as we can and sort of reimagine what assessment like might look like for the rest of the year because I mean yeah you can't you can't give a test to a kid and have him take it in his bedroom with his little brother poking him and his you know his mom's on a conference call and dad's on another conference call and the wi-fi is slow and the camera doesn't work and mm -hmm. everybody's kind of stressed out a bit anyway so um, we're kind of looking at, at, at what we can do to see what our kids are learning and get them to learn in, a, in as engaging a way as we can um, without doing assessments the way that we kind of typically think of assessments looking. So that's, that's what well, we're working on right now. We're even noticing like the work that, that I get, even uh, some of my families have hired tutors. <laughs> so the writing that I'm getting, there's no way that that student wrote that writing. I mean, I've been working with you all year. I, I know you didn't do that. So what I'm struggling a little bit with what are they doing independently and what are they not? And then even other students where I get a piece of writing and I think, I know I gave him feedback. Uh, and he, if I had been sitting in class with him, he would have produced something better. Uh, just, you know, them taking on the feedback and, and there's a few students that are just not, it's hard for them. I, I yeah, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not indicative of what they're capable of or in other in both both sides of it yeah, yeah. i want to say um i agree with that but i also think that for some kids this has actually perhaps even been a good move um not having yes. to sit through an 80 minute class yes uh, <laughs> exactly yes absolutely getting a, getting a little more detailed instructions like teachers i think are being more aware of how explicit they have to be so, yes. you know, as much as, you know, some subjects he's struggling because of the type of assessment that's being done in others, his grades are improving because he's uh, um, the design of the class has for him improved. And yeah, I mean, he even said, can I finish the rest of high school online? 
So just like there are some benefits to, to this, but I think we're gonna, if we're reflecting once we get back to school, and we might actually improve our practice in, in general. So I think that's been a positive thing out of it too. Thanks. Yeah. Anna. Um, Steve, I'm interested. What's what? What can you share about what's happening in the elementary school in in Latvia in terms of learning support? Sure. So um, we are uh, last week we had our spring break. Uh, so we are right now in our fifth week of virtual learning. So we had four weeks before the break. Uh, we did determine that we needed the whole break, that everyone kind of needed the whole break. Uh, for, for learning support right now, uh, I would say so Rachel Case is our learning support teacher. She's phenomenal. Uh, if you have a chance to connect with her at some point, I, I would recommend it. Um, and she right now is uh, she's doing some of the things that I'm hearing in terms of synchronous meetings with with uh, the students that are officially on her caseload. Um, but before we went virtual, she was spending uh, the, the vast majority of her time in classrooms, providing push-in support and supporting many additional students beyond those that are on her uh, sort of official load that have ILPs. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that she's doing now is in addition to having these synchronous Zoom meetings with students on her, uh, that are on her caseload, She's helping to track the progress and work with teachers to modify uh, activities on Seesaw mm -hmm. uh, to help out not only those students that are on her caseload, but some of those other students that we know need a little bit of extra support, um, maybe don't have an ILP. We, d we don't require uh, any sort of testing or diagnosis to receive support at our school. Uh, so, I mean, this, this leaves her pinging around mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, fortunately, Rachel is someone who I just trust implicitly, so I, um, I know maybe a, a quarter of uh, exactly what she's doing. We touch base very frequently. Uh, she was actually, I thought she was going to be on this call, uh, and uh, there must have been a connection issue of some kind, but um, if that helps. So I would say her time is going into um, Supporting students directly, supporting families, so working with parents as well, uh, who are, of course, having a terribly difficult time, uh, particularly those that maybe don't have English as, as a first or even a second or third language, um, and modifying uh, assignments for Seesaw, supporting teachers and development of activities that are differentiated for, I guess, all of the kids in their classes, um, and then helping to track students of concern uh, would be generally how she's spending her, her time now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was something Monica and I chatted about yesterday about the, that really important connection with parents and how you, you support parents. Not only you're supporting the parent, but you're also helping support them, support their child. Um, so I'm curious to know, you know how, how, what is that relationship with parents like now? Um, how's it shifted? Is that for me or for the room? For the, for the group. <laughs> you could answer it if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll let someone else take a stab. <laughs> I'll just quickly say that as a high school parent, I don't think that, that it's the same amount of support for high school parents. So I haven't noticed any real difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. Monica, what, what about you and your relationship with, with, with the parents, your fifth grade parents? Yeah, well, so this is interesting because I'm a parent, also, so I have a student, um, my personal children, I have uh, one in high school, one in middle, and one in primary. And so the middle and high school, I don't need a lot of support for those, those two of my children. I don't know how you would phrase that. <laughs> They're quite independent and um, on task. Uh, and I and I have had some of my friends kind of say they felt like they didn't get as much support and maybe that's because they don't need it in in high school and middle. Uh, I think in primary is where we've been facing more um, parents needing more support. I would say in grade five because we use a lot more technology when we are at school. Um, that barrier was slightly alleviated. Um, however, I do think uh, we've had to also be mindful that 
not everyone has enough devices at home to assume that children can be on a computer all day. Uh, for example, today, and if anyone has a solution for me, I would love it. Uh, one of my students said, how can I use read aloud on my iPad? Because that's the device I have to work on. So um, sometimes I think it's also what I've been trying to do is the second that I get an email from a parent that seems a little bit hmm, concerned is the wrong word, but just feeling like maybe they need more. I just set up a call. So just what can I do? How is it going at home? This is what I see. What can, what can we do to make this better? And I think just being really proactive um, has helped significantly. So for some students, I'm having to do a few more check-ins with them or just every morning they email me their schedule for the day. And in the end of the day, they email me and tell me what worked well and what didn't if I haven't had a slot with them during the day. Um, so it's just sort of adjusting to whatever students need, I suppose, is what I'm, what I'm doing, but I'm sure other people have other solutions. Okay. Marianne, what about you? How are you finding it with your students and, and relationship with your parents? Um, yeah, I actually, I mean, that again, I mean, as a classroom teacher, you know, building that relationship with your parents, but I'm very close to my parents. Um, again, I have, they're actually all boys, so like very active, want to move. I incorporate a lot of movement in our meetings as well, so they, they, they can get that energy out. But um, if I need anything from the parents, they're right there for me. And they, we have this relationship where they're asking me questions and um, instead of like through the seesaw thing, I just give direct like texts and stuff like that. Um, I only have like 12 kids on my caseload, so that's a little bit easier for me. Um, the one thing that I was gonna say about the parents doing the student work was that um, I made my kids write letters to their parents and said, dear parent, <laughs> I need to do my own work. Um, so it just started this week. Um, because now we've been in eight weeks, so there's been a lot of support, a lot of support, and they needed that, but now we need to release, especially since we're not, I mean, I don't know, but I'm guessing we're not gonna go back to school. So we do need to get like a final kind of pulse on where they are. Um, and the other thing I've started doing is uh, uh, giving them like mini assessments, like watching them write in front of me by themselves. I did that um, this week too. <laughs> yeah, while, while coaching them, you know, like, oh, I see, you know, talking to himself. I see his pencil moving. And they, they need that encouragement, but they, you know, they need to do it independently. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, to be fair, out of my 30, I think there's one or two that it's not their work, to be fair. <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> We've, I've been doing, I've been playing memory games with my kid. I took a picture of items, show them the photo, and then another photo with like three items missing and like just things to try and um, get their energy out a little, like you were saying, even in grade five, just build up the energy at the beginning of the lesson a little bit. I think it's, we have to be creative and thinking about different ways of doing it different ways. And today we did a chat box poetry just to kick it off. Everybody like added a different word or a line. So just trying to think of different ways to do that. I love that idea of the the letter, you know, to the, the, the parents saying, you know, I want to take ownership of my own learning and this is, you know, this is how you can support me in doing this. Um, and, and Monica, I know we've chatted about that as well, about how do we support kids when they're at home, they're not with you. How do we support them to, to take ownership of their learning? What are some strategies and tools? What's been working um, for, for you? Me or the room? And anyone, yeah. I, yeah, the others. Um, I, I collect their work. I, I'm, I'm making the units briefer. So it's like one week, like we, we did a unit on jokes. We do, and then uh, I collect their work and I post it on like a, um, a PowerPoint, you know, so I, by the end of the week, they have a book and then we read the book that they write. I mean, I guess I have younger kids, but just um, that, like gets them to, they, they feel accountable because they know on Friday there's gonna be a celebration of their work. And if it's not there, you didn't turn it in, you didn't send it to me. Um, and I try to make their book like beautiful. You know, I, try to, I try to post the work so it looks very nice with their names on it. And then they can all, we can all read it together. And that's, uh, you know, small groups, like six kids. So it's like a six page book or something like that. Oh, okay. We, we actually just ran some passion, they did passion projects 
Um, and then we had them share them virtually and then they had to give feedback to each other in one of our sessions. So it actually was fantastic because they were really mindful when they went in and looked at each other's passion projects, they took notes. And then you could see in all our sessions today, they were giving fantastic feedback, like much better quality feedback than they would have done at school. Cause we had done passion projects, I think in January. Um, so that, that was really great. And so we're running something new now um, around the global goals and they'll do a different inquiry into that. And I think we'll do the same sort of thing about giving feedback. So they know that other people in their class will be looking at their work and giving them feedback and that has kind of helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other ideas from anyone else about how to kind of build that ownership of, of learning? Yeah, I think uh, just one thing that I know that we did in our primary was that we, when we knew we were going to go into distance learning, we uh, created a schedule of what that day was going to look like. We didn't just push it on the students and say, hey, this is what your day is going to look like going forward now that we're all going to be learning from home. We showed it to them and let them see the, the, the schedule of, of what teachers are going to be doing and where they're going to be. And we had each of those students uh, create their own schedule. Now, they didn't really have any flexibility into it. I mean, they're, they're, they're young and they're, they're thinking about their day and they're thinking about where their breaks are going to be, but then they were taking the, the sort of master schedule and looking at their schedule and creating their own schedule. And that really created a, a sense of agency for a lot of them that they were designing what their day was going to look like and they started building in the structure of what learning from home was going to look like. And just that little tiny tweak of, hey, we need you guys to all uh, pitch in and create your own daily schedule for this piece and this is what it's sort of going to look like and then we'd fill in the gaps if they missed something or decided to uh, skip a, a subject or something in there but it, it really it was just tiniest little thing and it really made a, a big big difference every day they're coming in and they've got their schedule that they put together and they're they're ready to take kind of charge of their learning it was just a fantastic little little tweak that um, I'm not sure who came up with it but it, it totally Kind of set the tone for distance learning in our primary years uh going on six weeks now oh wonderful yeah. i like that clint can you imagine being six years old and you can tell your parents i don't have to do what you tell me <laughs> <laughs> yeah we might have thrown the parents under the bus but <laughs> <laughs> that's probably not a bad thing yeah we actually did something similar with um i teach grade seven well, i teach grade seven and 12 right now um but the grade sevens um we kind of took a break from the unit that we were teaching um, and decided to have a science fair because why not have a science fair? So we gave them three categories. We said they could do an ecology project. So they go outside and do some, you know, little population studies in their yard, or they could do an experiment. We gave them a whole list of ideas and then some places to find other ideas, or they could build a model of something like a, you know, a wave machine or, or whatever. Um, so they got to pick and they got to choose the students that they were working with. We had a little bit of a say in that. So we kind of went, you two cannot work together well. Why don't we, you know, organize it this way? But for the most part, they picked their groups. And then we gave them kind of a timeline and said, you need to fill in the timeline and make sure that everybody's contributing parts of the project every session. So our, our, we cut our timetable in half um, so that we only have three lessons a day instead of six. Um, so they're only meeting twice. They're only actually meeting in class twice a week, but they can their time outside of class time is, is a bit flexible. Um, so we let them plan what they're going to do during class time and then what they might feel like working on outside of class time if they want to work on it. Um, so they just they have to fill in that timetable and make sure that everybody has pieces of the project to do. So they kind of are holding each other accountable. If you know Tim doesn't hold up his end of the bargain, then the project's not going to work. Um, so there's a little bit of sort of peer accountability, um, but also just the fact that they got to choose the project that they wanted to do they're invested in it so they're they they it's they dove into it faster than i think i've seen them dive into anything all year and we did a lot of really fun stuff this year so they're, they're really enjoying it because they got to pick what they wanted to do um at the end of the project we're going to put we're going to have like a virtual science fair so we're going to build a website and each group gets a page and they can do they need to have a video where they present what they did, but then any visuals that they want to use, they can make a slideshow, they can put up like a, you know, they can use Google Draw to make a poster, however they want to present their work, they can, they can do that. Um, but they, because we gave them sort of full ownership of the project, they're, they're really enjoying it and they're kind of keeping each other on task, which has been really, really fun to watch actually. I'm going to steal that. 
we're starting a pro we're starting we start next week on we're, we group them around global the global goals the UN global goals and they've decided which ones they're interested in mm -hmm. yeah I'm <laughs> curious Erin what would you think if you did exactly the same thing but you were back in school in a classroom do you think it would would it would they be just as engaged and motivated um, I think they would, but it might be harder, almost harder to organize because they're, you know, at this stage, they're using the this, this stuff that they have access to um, and they kind of have a, a bit of free reign. Whereas if I had 24 kids in my classroom, I can't let them really, okay, you six that are doing ecology, go ahead outside and, you know, count bugs in this patch of grass or whatever. Um, but they can go out in their backyard and, you know, they, they're kind of forced to use the things that they have, which I think is adding a, a little bit of a level of engagement because they have to, they have to dig into it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, they get an idea and they go, oh, I don't have that, but how can I make this project work even though I don't have that? So it's, it's, it's kind of adding a level of engagement to it that I, I'm not sure we'd get if we were in the classroom and we just opened up the cabinet and said, these are the things that you can use, you know, good luck. Mm -hmm. Well, I, we were also thinking, we were speaking today when they were giving each other feedback that, you know, they haven't spoken to each other or seen each other. They have, but not in the same way. So I think they really took their time looking at the project, thinking about uh, what kind of feedback they wanted to give. It was, it was, it was really impressive. You know, usually you get, oh, I like that you use that font. And, you know, but it was really like they had done some deep thinking about, about what they wanted to say. So it was good. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing that's really helping is the fact that we cut our timetable in half. And now we have kind of, you know, longer blocks of time available to the kids and fewer things. They're not switching gears every hour. You know, it's like nine to almost, you know, it's like nine to nine, 30, nine 15 to 10 45 is one period. And we don't expect them to be in class that whole period. We tend to plan maybe an hour's worth of work for them to do during that 90 minute block. So they can kind of schedule it. We do a mix of synchronous and asynchronous work during that time. So we might have a Google meet to start them off and then they go and do something for a while they can take a break if they need to, you know, check in at the end of the period and then they get a break and then they go on to their next class. So the fact that they have more time available um, rather than, okay, the hour's up off to math class. Okay, that hour's up off to English class. It lets them kind of dig into it a little bit more and take a bit of a deeper dive, which I think is making it work a little bit better. Mm -hmm. We, we even found that um, with our students with the writing activity we set out this week because we just decided to like, let's, let's make it really targeted and we slowed it right down for the whole week. They, if there's a kid who gets through that, there's still two other columns of work they could do. But what exactly what you're saying, they're producing better work because it's all slowed down. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's something to think about going back or going <laughs> forward, going back when we go back going forward. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, what you mentioned about uh, going back is very interesting because um, a couple of weeks ago I ran a um, spring camp virtually. So I worked with um, groups of kids, one group in the morning and one in the afternoon. And a lot of the work that we did, I, I kept um, telling them that, okay, when we get back to school, there's the second part which you can work on. So we're working on things like uh, coding, microbits and coding, coding circuit playground express uh, circuits. And then we say, okay, when we get back to school, we're going to build a project. We're going to complete the project when we get back to school. And, uh, you know, it gets them very excited, very motivated. In fact, uh, I find they were more focused and more uh, engaged than physically being in a club or a camp uh, back then. And that, that really surprised me. Um, the other thing was uh, that I, I do get sometimes students sending me a message to say, oh, I'm working on this and I'm working on that. And uh, I said, yeah, that's cool. And uh, so what I have in mind now is to kind of organize a virtual maker fair. Uh, won't be able to use the name maker fair, but I would have to think of another name. And I've had a few families sending me, you know, questions like, oh, can we do this? And can we do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I created kind of like a simple uh, list of things that can be done at home and if they want, they can use those. Otherwise, they can come up with their own ideas. So stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Simon was waving his hand. Oh, Marianne's gone. Um, she, um, one of the things is actually was Marianne um, actually just made me think about, she talked about movement. 
Um, and I know Monica and I talked a little bit about that, you know, that, that normally in a normal class she would have with her learning support students, there would be movement involved. Um, it would be active. Um, and so, um, you know, Monica, I'm, I'm interested, how do you, um, with these classes that you have with your students now online, how do you build that kind of action and activity um, into, into, into part of the learning that you're doing? Um, so, you know, I don't, unlike a lot of you, I'm not, I, we are, we haven't set it up yet where we have big chunks of time that we are working and teaching. We're doing smaller and shorter sessions. So I have to be really mindful. So we started with like the memory game. We've done that this week. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get them to think about moving throughout the day. So some of the students that I'm having them make their schedule for me, I'm telling them when they're doing, we're, we're still doing a lot of read alouds and they have to listen to an audio book and then do a response to it. So I'm having them move to the living room to listen to your audio book and then go back to your kitchen table to your work or whatever you're doing. So I'm trying to also get them to think about movement during their day. I mean, of course, we're all reminding them that they should go for a walk or do some sort of exercise, but I've been trying to remind them that during the school day, we move in primary school, probably every half an hour to 45 minutes, maybe an hour, but even in an hour, they might be on the carpet and then they would get an iPad and they would sit down. And so um, I've been having them build in their schedule, just moving to different locations to try, try and get them that little tiny brain break. Mm -hmm. In my sessions with them, it's I have to just capitalize on that time I have with them. So I've, I've had less success with that because I just need to use every minute that I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any ideas of how to get keep, keep kids moving? Well, we, we've been having conversations with our classroom teachers about um, the video lessons for the asynchronous times of the day. Um, because once we dove into remote learning, uh, the teachers were trying to cram in so much content that their videos, some of them were 15, 20 minutes long. And oh, so, you know, asking elementary students to sit for that long uh, you know, eats up all their time where they could be taking body breaks and brain breaks. You know, if they have to sit through a 20 minute video for math and then do their math work and then a 20 minute video for reading, it doesn't leave a lot of time uh, to be able to move around and, and exercise. So uh, our learning support teachers have been working with our classroom teachers. Uh, they offered sort of an optional PD session, but also just in their conversations talking about how can you do more with less? How can you make your video four minutes long and still explain, give an example, have them try it. You know, how can you hit all of those things you want in a mini lesson, but in a shorter amount of time so that the student is engaged the whole time and can have extra moments to, to take a brain break. Um, Cause I think that's important too. We can't expect our students to be sitting through hours upon hours of screen time um, because they need to have those breaks built in. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. I mean, it's, we've always worked with our teachers on making their mini lessons short, whether it's online or in the classroom. Uh, it's tough. Teachers like to well, talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we were speaking about this at the beginning. Like I, one of the videos I made for them this week, my videos are always like less than three minutes and it's more of a tip thing. And it was about organizing their time. And then I drew them like my house and how I had moved during the day. So part of it was I always looked for a table with a chair, but also that I knew I needed to move during the day to keep my brain fresh. So we're trying to model it for them a little bit too remotely as much as we can. Yeah, I think I think part of it's a, a bit of a mindset too. I think we need to, I think probably all of us could benefit from getting away from this idea of we have to get through this content. Do we have to get through this content or can we, you know, take advantage of the time and work on some, you know, in, in IB, we have these ATL skills and it's, to me, it's a perfect opportunity to work on some of those, those ATLs, you know, the kind of 21st century skills and maybe get the kids working on some different stuff. I mean, I, uh, you know, again, I teach grade seven and grade 12, great. My grade 12s are out of the picture at this stage because they canceled the exams. Um, so I think for if you have really, you know, the, the kids I think who are struggling the most at this stage are the grade 11 students because they really do need to get through the content so they can be ready for the BP exams next year. But, the, you know, I feel like my middle school kids, even up through grade 10, maybe we just work on some of those, you know, those research skills or those critical thinking skills and do stuff that's a, a bit out of the box and kind of let go of that content. I don't, I don't feel like... It, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe we don't need to do so no. much content at this point. Maybe we can well, do something we, a little bit different. 
So in grade five, we're, we're smack in the middle of what should be our exhibition. So we started by just doing mini passion projects and then we kind of had this whole brain and the problem with passion projects. So was that that meant I have a caseload of 25 to 30 students. So I was finding resources on 25 different subjects. Like that is not sustainable for anyone. So we thought about using the global goals and that way, um, they filled in a Google form. We, we found like videos online they watched, they filled, they watched a video, they did a Google form and then we could group them. And now across five classes, I have like a whole bunch of kids doing water. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of kids doing zero hunger. Um, and so I think they're still going to get the whole, what you're talking about, like research, critical thinking, looking at something they're passionate about. We haven't taken the passion away. We, we've narrowed it slightly, but they're still can hit all those targets without making it so overwhelming for everyone. So, yeah. Yeah. I know our middle school's done the same. I have a middle schooler as well. And exactly what you just said there, they, typically in grade eight, they're able to, they have this end of year kind of project and they're able to, I think, pick almost anything. Um, but they've, I think they were planning on revamping it anyway, and it just happened to be a good time to do it. And so now the options are more, I mean, there's still enough variety, but a little more limited so that they can support them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I'm just looking at the time. It's it's nearly um, eight o'clock. So um, if if there's anyone who wants to have a final word, something that they want to say that they haven't had the opportunity to, um, now is your um, chance to to do that. I think we're good. If not, I want to thank Monica very much for um, stepping forward to, um, to host this and to come and talk about her practice and what she's doing um, uh, this evening. Uh, coming up in terms of um, learning two threads, I think there's one being um, planned, I think, for next week, which will be um, for schools that are reopening. Um, that's a really hot topic at the moment. So watch out through the um, L2 um, kind of media channel, uh, channels for, for that being um, advertised.